Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hello, this is Lily, and today we are speaking with Dr. James Kelly who believes that leadership is an evolution that sometimes requires a revolution to fully live and lead authentically. In his inaugural book, The Crucible's Gift, Five Lessons from Authentic Leaders Who Thrive in Adversity, James provides the authentic leadership model and backs it up by summarizing over 200 interviews with executives. James finds that once a leader stopped asking why it happened to me and begins asking why did it happen for me, their leadership development grew. Leaders began to develop their self-awareness, live with more compassion, show up with integrity and value relationships. However, one caveat that James puts forth is that none of the growth happens without a growth mindset. James currently resides just outside Dubai, where he is an associate professor, speaker, facilitator, author, and the CEO of a startup called QChange. James and his family are moving back to the U.S. in July 2020 so that James can pursue QChange full-time. Welcome, Dr. James Kelly. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, Lily. How are you doing? I'm doing well. We're so happy to have you on our podcast. So are you ready to pour into our listeners? I'm ready to give whatever you believe your listeners need and want from your guests. Fantastic. There's a lot. All right. Okay. (laughs) So can you tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now? This question to me is the best and worst question ever because the journey is incredibly long. It's like laying a brick. It's like the Great Wall of China for me. I grew up in a house that was lower middle class in Portland, Oregon. And there were not many high hopes for me academically, to be honest with you. And so sports was one of those areas that probably if it wasn't for sports, I would have failed out of school. But I definitely wasn't the athlete who over excelled either on the other side of it. But yeah, so I went to University of Dayton in Ohio. And You know, in my third year there, 1995, my father passed away. And so, you know, with that, I think there are trials, tribulations, challenges. There are reflection periods. There are questions, you know, anything you can think of as a Mm -hmm. 20-year-old, it happened. I was already a fairly insecure individual. Mm -hmm. And with being an insecure individual at 20, it is magnified tenfold. When your dad dies, you know? Mm. So when I graduated, I barely got out. Like, I remember the semester my dad died, I got a 1.9, which mm-hmm. if one of my kids got 1.9 now, I would be really unhappy. I don't know how my mom did not snap and kill me at that point. But I did get out eventually. I do owe credit to a girlfriend I had at the time who was super nerdy and went to the library all the time. And so I just wanted to be with her. So I went to the library all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of what got me through. And so I kind of just stumbled and bumbled and I had a job at 24 opening up an advertising agency for a national firm, grossly underqualified, but I grossly oversold myself in the same interview. You were good at advertising. I was good at something. BS is probably what I would sell it as, but uh, I was good at it. And so I did that. And after about maybe 16 months, uh, I left. In some ways, I think I I had a panic attack. Uh, I remember sitting at my desk turning white and shaking. I was just very underprepared for the stress that Mm -hmm. that was going to be. Because, you know, at 24, my boss was in Dallas. So Mm -hmm. I had to hire the staff. I had to get the furniture. I had to set up the phones. I had to manage everything. I had to do the new business sales. I had to figure out how to present and how to do sales pitches. And, and, you know, there was just a lot. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a mentor next to me. Some people are wired to do that and they're great at it. I survived, but I needed to probably be in an environment that was a bit more structured for Mm a 24-year-old. So anyhow, I left there, went to my next job uh, down in San Jose, and I ended up being there only four months doing the same thing, different company, and it was just a mess. So I was there two months, and we had our annual sales meeting. What I do remember vividly is that 
all of the managers stayed at a three-star hotel, but the executive stayed at a five-star resort down the street. Hmm. So culturally, mm -hmm. that is not a cool place to be. So my personality is quite unique into where if I don't think something is just or right, I tend to speak up or at least act out in a way that says, this isn't fair. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not treating people with respect and kindness. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you remember, Lily, this was in 2000. If you remember, like this is when email was just pretty popular, but virus scanning wasn't the norm. If you ever get an email, but you know you shouldn't really click on it, but you're really curious about it, so you would click on it. <laughs> you were that guy? Yeah, I was that guy. And so I did that, and I subsequently knocked out 20 of the 22 offices with a virus within like an hour. What? So. Needless to say, two weeks later, the locks on the door were changed and I was out of a job. So, <laughs> so I got fired, but I was okay with that uh, because the place was dysfunctional. I didn't care. So I went from there to get my MBA in New York City. And I spent two years in New York City. And then I was coaching water polo at the time because that was a sport I played in college. And so I thought to myself, I'm going to be a college water polo coach. I was passionate about it. I loved the teaching side of it. I loved the coaching side of it. I love the lifestyle, but if you're going to have a family, water polo is not really a career path at the end of the day. It's a hobby, but mm -hmm. it's not a career path. So I went from there to Japan, and I lived in Japan for a year teaching English, and then I came back to the States, and I moved back to Portland, Oregon. You get the theme. I've moved quite a bit at this point. You know, I wrote down this word, pivots, like a lot yes. of pivots in your life. Yeah. We're not even done yet. Hold on. No, point. I know where you ended up. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I ended up in Portland, Oregon for a year and I had a contract and they let me make up the name I wanted for the title of the job, which I think is hysterical. So I gave myself the title Director of New Business Funnel Development, which I don't even know what that means, but I was able to do that title. And so I sat on the phone for a year with an MBA making between 70 and 100 calls a day trying to get companies interested in this company's software to give to the sales executives. That's literally all I did for a year. So I went from there and I had a decision point. I was going to go into the Peace Corps. That's so why I had applied, I'd gotten in, I got stationed to Eastern Europe and I was in an information session and at the end of the information session, everyone left except for the organizer and two or three of her friends came who were PhD students from Africa. And we all sat down and at this time, I was reading The Economist a lot for some reason. I was just reading it cover to cover every single week. So I sat down with these gentlemen and this woman, and we had an intelligent, thoughtful, reflective, deep conversation. But what I remember most, is I had this stigma in my head, I couldn't believe that I was holding a smart conversation with PhD students. Hmm. And I just thought to myself, wow, I think I could get a PhD. And to give perspective, neither one of my parents finished college. Mm -hmm. My mom's rally cry for university for me was just give it a try. Mm -hmm. So education, it was important, but it wasn't expected from someone like me. And I'm sure you've met so many people like this in your podcast that were probably undiagnosed with ADD. Yep. Uh, you know, it was the seventies, early eighties. It really wasn't well known at that point. I mean, now everyone's on some medicine for something for ADD, which now it's gone too far the other way, in my opinion. But when I had that conversation, I just thought maybe I could get my PhD. And so I started applying for universities. And so I got in and I moved to Australia. And so I went to a university in Australia called the University of Western Australia, which is like an Ivy League school in Australia. I just had the bug for going international. Have you ever traveled at all, Louis? I have, but not as much as you have. <laughs> I just live places. Most people just travel and come back to their home. So I have a different approach apparently. It's like an adventure, my first question with you. <laughs> So I went to Australia and I went to Perth, all the way on the West Coast. No one ever goes there from the States. They get to Sydney and Melbourne and that's about it. It's another five hour flight. And I was there for four years. And while I was there, I met my wife who is American and we got married and had our first kid. And I felt the pressure at that point to hurry up and finish, to mature a little bit and to get a job. And so I ascended to higher ed and I moved to Philadelphia and I took my first teaching position at St. Joseph's University there. And so I spent seven years there, but you know, one of my attributes as having probably ADD as an adult, but not nearly as much as a child, is that I love to chase the shiny thing on the side. Yeah. And so whenever there's an opportunity for me to do something fun and exciting, I go chase it. Mm -hmm. Now, you've interviewed quite a few people in higher ed, 
So as you know all too well, the golden cup is tenure. That is it. People spend really five years just grinding out to get tenure. Mm -hmm. And so I did okay. I had five publications, but I was always doing other things. And so people all love me. Like I'm a really great person to work with because I'm happy. I'm, I make people smile. I'm entertaining. I, I work hard in the classroom. Adventurous, curious, funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it makes me a great colleague. However, when you're giving out a job for life, you want to know someone who's committed to the university. And so right. I didn't give that perception. And I knew everybody on the rank and tenure committee. In fact, my really good friend and boss at the time was on the committee and they turned me down solely because they knew that I couldn't focus mm -hmm. well enough. And I own it. I don't place blame. It's a waste of energy. So I went from there to where I'm at now, which is just outside Dubai at a university called United Emirates University. And so I live in the Middle East. I wrote a book last year called The Crucible's Gift, Five Lessons from Authentic Leaders That Thrive in Adversity. I'm humbled, but it was recommended by some very important, significant people in leadership. I'm really proud of that book. Mm -hmm. In fact, this interview is probably well-timed. My audiobook just came out, and the audiobook is awesome because, I don't know if you ever listen to audiobooks, but it's usually one person talking the whole time. Right. This is actually three actors playing different parts in the book. And so in my book, I used my old podcast, Executive After Hours, which is still up on iTunes. And I took excerpts of all the interviews that I thought added value and made the point of the book about why adversity is important and how to be more compassionate mm -hmm. and live mm -hmm. with more integrity. And so I have actors playing the different characters in the book from the interviews. And so it makes for a really dynamic listen. Oh. Finally, the last little bit, and then you've caught up to where I'm at in leadership. You know, I'm doing some consulting on the side speaking. I just published my TED talk, which I'm quite proud of. And I have a startup. And so at the end of next year, I will leave academia and I will become a full-time entrepreneur and stop chasing all the shiny things. One of the interviews I do in the book is from a guy named Mo Kadat. Mo Kadat used to be the chief strategy officer for Google. Clearly somebody with some insight and intelligence. And he wrote a book called Solve for Happy, and, it, and he, he left Google now, and his whole entire mission is to make a billion people happy. That's all he wants to do. Oh, I love that. And so one of the things that he says and writes and talks about, and I wholeheartedly believe, is that whatever force you believe in, God, spirit, divinity, whatever, it will nudge you in the direction you're meant to go. And so when you look at my history over the last 10 years, and me chasing and trying to start up probably three companies before I got to the Middle East, I decided this time that I was gonna listen to that nudge and clear all the barriers and all the rationale and all the reasons, and most importantly, get my wife on board because we have four kids and it's a huge risk. And so we are in lockstep about what I'm gonna do next, and that's my startup. And so the startup is all about changing behavior using technology. And it's a unique tool, specifically, and I just made this decision today, so it's not definitive, so I'm probably mm -hmm. spilling the beans early, but the technology is really around leadership development and helping leaders become better leaders in the organization at points of choice as they go on their journey to move within the organization. Mm -hmm. So next year, we will move back to the States, and we have decided to move to Bend, Oregon, which is just east of the Cascade Mountains in Central Oregon, but it's a beautiful town. It's like Denver or mm -hmm. Boulder. And it's about 100,000 people, and it's awesome. It's people from San Francisco and Seattle and Denver who just wanted to kind of downsize and wanted to have a better lifestyle, less traffic and all that. Mm -hmm. And that's it. We're up to date, Lily. That is everything. Okay, thanks for having me. Have a great, great night. So we have caught you at the birth of another pivot, correct? Yeah, so this is, this correct. is pretty significant because you put a lot of thought and soul into this pivot. And it's not an impulsive thing. It's something that you're really mindful about, correct? I think that's a really great question because, you know, as I started going down this path, my wife was like, I don't understand how this connects. You just wrote a book. You just got certified in something called appreciative inquiry. And now you want to do this tech company about behavior change. It's all connected. Yeah. And I, yeah, that's exactly what I said. I go, when you think about it, I can now use the principles of my leadership book and put them into practice. 
I can take the appreciative inquiry to manage the teams in the organization and create an appreciative organization culturally. Mm -hmm. I can take the ideas I have in my mind of what makes a great organization and put it into practice. And I'm helping other people become better human beings through the use of technology versus detracting from themselves because of technology. Mm -hmm. You know, one feature of the business is I want to use technology in the workplace to actually create choreographed conversations with people you would never, ever talk to in an organization. Because what science is very clear about is that when your culture flourishes, people have an inkling of caring about those around them. Mm -hmm. And if you can create that and foster that by having them ask real, bona fide, genuine, appreciative questions, magic erupts. I've seen it when I facilitate. I've seen it in my TED Talk. It happens every single time mm -hmm. if you ask the right questions. Questions that add value to people. You're absolutely right. You've spoken about your book. Where can we find that? I mean, the audio book is everywhere. Any place you can get an audio book, it is there. The Kindle and hardback is on Amazon, Apple, and all the other traditional places as well. And do you have a website? It's drjameskelly.com, D-R-James-K-E-L-L-E-Y.com. Perfect. So now tell us about your leadership style. As a leader, you have to be open to the possibility that there's other possibilities, in my opinion. What that means to me is that when I work with teams or I'm leading a team, I'm more inclined to ask a lot of questions to build consensus in the group and then match that with what I believe is the best choice. So it may not always overlap 100%, but I try to find pieces of what people say and take that and move it forward into my vision so that they feel heard. Aspects of me as servant leader, mm -hmm. there's aspects of me that are transformational leader, and overarching theme is that I'm an authentic leader. Which is all connected, really. It is, and my personality, and what I believe is that if you start with being authentic, you can be agile and be all sorts of different types of leaders, as long as you're comfortable with yourself and you're thinking of others. So as far as connecting with people, obviously you have a goal in mind. Is there a process? Yeah. So I use a term called micro moments of meaning. And what I encourage people to do in an organization, especially if you're a leader, is to create these 15 to 30 second interactions with those that you lead that leave them with a smile. Mm -hmm. These are usually incidental conversations in the hallway, at the coffee pot, wherever. But the reason why that's really important is that scientifically, when you leave somebody on a positive note, a neuron fires, and then that increases the likelihood that they're going to go off and have a positive conversation themselves. Now imagine if you have a whole organization that is focused on creating those micro moments of meaning over a duration of an eight hour day. Now it's utopia, but if we can get close to that, that makes the organization more positive, more compassionate, more collaborative, more innovative, more productive, and all of those things, which are all intertwined with each other, end up actually increasing the bottom line and makes people actually enjoy going to work, which all research says only about 20% of the people do. Well, because we're not really intentional about creating those micro moments. I can think about just this morning, I just blew it with someone. And now I'm texting to apologize because I need to talk to them. But it's so easy to not do that. Why do you think that is for you? Like just in general? So for me, it was stress and frustration because I was supposed to be at a certain place. Very mm -hmm. important. And I couldn't find parking anywhere. And I was there early mm. enough to find parking. So then I, I'm calling someone and I lost the number and it was bad. And you know what that boils down to is your expectation. So you had an expectation and it wasn't met and that just triggered everything else. Yeah. You know, you should know better, right? You should. And you're human yeah. and you can't control it. But we try to hold on to what we can't control. And that's where our anxiety and frustration and we start turning inward to ourselves. And right. as soon as it happens in an organization, especially when a leader does it, dysfunction rises really fast. Yeah. Creating those micro moments, that's certainly something that we have to do intentionally. And especially in a school setting, there's a lot that comes at us, but there are so many opportunities where mm -hmm. we can practice this. So thank you so much for that. Now, tell us about a leader who inspires you. I'm going to give you a really bad answer. I'm going to tell you that ahead of time. <laughs> so right, just, I, and this is another one of these factors of why I kind of want to depart higher ed. 
I haven't had a really great experience with leaders in higher ed. When I was in St. Joe's, mm -hmm. the woman who was the chair of the department, she was great. She was fantastic. But overall, there, higher ed breeds, unfortunately, you have typically a bunch of PhDs who tend to think they're the smartest person in the room all the time. Mm -hmm. And when you have that, that means ego is in the play. When ego's in the play, that means the greater good isn't necessarily going to be followed. And so mm -hmm. I've always kind of struggled in higher ed. Even here in the Middle East, it's really prevalent for different cultural reasons. And so I would love to tell you I've had a slew of leaders that would have been amazing. Now, what I will tell you is I've experienced leaders that are amazing that I don't report to. And so one would be a gentleman named John Berghoff, and he's the co-founder of a company called the Flourishing Leadership Institute out of mm -hmm. Cleveland. And he's associated with Case Western. And in fact, one of the guys on his board is Dr. David Kupenreiter. So for any of your team out there or listeners that know Appreciative Inquiry, he's the founder of that. And John does two and a half day, twice a year onboarding process of those to teach them how to facilitate doing Appreciative Inquiry. And he is honestly one of the most brilliant facilitators I've ever been around. You wouldn't know, but prior to any event, he is so prepared and organized. But in the moment, he seems so relaxed and carefree and doesn't care mm -hmm. and goes with the flow when things go wrong. And he's totally cool with it. But the way he leads and motivates and moves people is a really powerful thing. And so I really appreciate being around people like that mm -hmm. who can move the crowd by the words and actions and spirit that they mm -hmm. give out, the aura, if you will. Like people who are comfortable in their own skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's totally that guy. There's a friend of mine who's a teacher out of Detroit. I went to college with him. He's one of those guys. Mm -hmm. So he does linked crew. He travels all around the U.S. And he teaches freshman high school how to lead. He's the most energetic, magnetic, honest, authentic, entertaining, intelligent. He's one teacher of the year in the Detroit area. Like He's an amazing educator. And he is inspiring when you see and hear what he does, I wish the world was full of teachers like him. Great. Hey, leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. If you haven't downloaded your copy of the Master Leadership Journal, go to masterleadership.org forward slash MLJ to get instant access and begin growing your leadership with questions that have been curated by top level leaders. I've also included some cool extras for you at masterleadership.org forward slash MLJ. Now, what's the best advice you've ever received? My first job, my boss who was in Dallas, who was an old school manager, did give me advice that I actually to this day repeat all the time. Two bits of advice. The first one was, if you receive feedback once, put it on a shelf and think about it. If you receive it twice, it's probably true. You might want to really inspect it and do something about it. But if you hear it a third time, you sure should do something. Like, and he used different language, by the way. Mm -hmm. But basically, the repetition of hearing the same feedback from three different people is probably a good sign that it's not them, it's you. Right? And that you're not listening. Yeah. So for me, that's always been a barometer. If I've heard the same thing from two different people, I'm like, okay, that's, okay. that's at least data points. The second bit that I heard that holds true is that hard work beats talent when talent stops working hard. And it's a little bit of a sports metaphor, but I got that from a leader. And on that same topic, because he was lecturing me at the same time, there's no substitute for hard work. In today's world, unfortunately, a lot of people my age, younger, think that you're famous or you have lots of money overnight. And they never see the five, 10 years before that where the person was killing themselves right. to get to that point. Right. And even preparing, like you spoke about your friend who's really well prepared and works hard right before he gets to serve right. other people or to lead or, or to facilitate. So can you tell us about a challenge that you've experienced and how it shaped your life? Can we just start another episode? Because I've had many. <laughs> Let's drill down on one. So th there's something about the word that I, I want to flip in this conversation. I think the word challenges for me, I really work hard to say they're not challenges, they're opportunities. And the reason is that this comes out of my book really clear. For a majority of leaders that I interviewed, and for myself included, and I'll give you a specific example in a second, that ended up on their feet, ended up being happy with themselves, excelling in life, they all had to go through some sort of adversity. And they had to embrace the suck. 
mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And for some of them, the, the transformation was relatively quick, three, six months. Some it was 12 years. Some it was a repeated glutton for punishment. But all of them came out the other side saying, you know what? I am so happy that happened to me. I'm such a better person. It gave me such an opportunity. On my TED Talk, I talk about the idea of often when people make the transformational leap in their life, they move from an event happened to me to an event happened for me. Mm -hmm. And when that happens transformationally, think about the framework in your brain that you're saying at that moment, right? The to me is such a victim mentality that it's almost depleting to your ability to grow as an individual. But for me, creates a whole new framework in your brain. And you start searching for what it was about that that you can take and embrace and use moving forward. So for me, I mean, having four kids is a challenge every day. Well, how old are they? 11, nine, soon to be six, and four tomorrow. All right, so that's a challenge right now. Wait now, for the next 20 years, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> Wait till the teenagers, my friend. That's what I mean. Like, I got 20 years of this. I'm not going anywhere. Now, thank God I'm bald already because I would probably lose it in the next 20 years. Yeah, they lose their mind. We have we've to deal with that. <laughs> we've already started with my 11-year-old talking about puberty and like how you're going to feel like you're out of control and this, this rush of emotion is going to come and you're going to say things that you might be hurtful and we might get angry at you, but we love you and just know that we understand that you're going through all of these changes. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't deal with this already. You're only 11. Come on. So besides that, really, I've had so many, my dad's death. Mm -hmm. I got a DUI at 24. That was hugely transformational in my life. Mm -hmm. Getting my PhD was transformational because again, I was not supposed to do that. You literally, and I can say this with 100% certainty, could ask anybody I graduated with from high school or college, and none of them would tell you I would have got a PhD from a good university. Nobody. Well, that's so, a lot of persistence, a lot of perseverance. It does. I quit college after my freshman year, and I moved back to Portland from Ohio, and I lived with my grandma at the time. And she said to me, she goes, you know, I don't worry about you. You're really resilient. I worry about your cousins. Ooh, wow. Um, it mm -hmm. didn't really register to me at 19, yeah. but man, those words must have sunk in somewhere. Probably my DUI was the most transformational because part of the court mandate for not to be on my record is I had to go to outpatient program for two years total. And so the first six months was four nights a week for three hours a night. Then it was six months for once a week for three hours. And then it was a, a year of therapy for the approved mm -hmm. psychologist. But I thought at 24 when I went into that, that's when I had the mentality of, you know what? It happened for me. And mm -hmm. so when I went into that situation, I just was open. I was mm -hmm. open to learning. I was open to understanding. I was open to be vulnerable. So you had the DUI. You, you weren't thinking that at that time. You weren't thinking this happened for me. When was no, I did. No, I did. At I that was, moment. At that moment. Yeah. Okay. Because, that's you know, I thought to myself, I have to do it. So what are my choices? Be bitter and angry or be open and opportunistic of what could happen? And so- Were there people in your life talking to you about this or it just came to you? This is a pattern, by the way. So well mm -hmm. done you picking this up. I was the youngest by five years in my house. And so my mom and dad were very old school. Kids were more seen than heard and definitely not played with. And so my brothers were swimmers. And if you're a swimming family, your life- is swimming. It's mornings, nights, weekends. So I was by myself a lot. We didn't have any kids in our neighborhood and I was told to kind of get in my own head. And so from a really young age, I can vividly remember days just, just kind of by myself outside shooting baskets or playing matchbox cars or my ventriloquent dummy that I had, Charlie. Really? <laughs> um, yeah. I couldn't do it, but it was like my best bud and we wrestled all the time together and okay. stuff like that. And so, creepy. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally creepy. I don't still have him, by the way. Okay. Like, you know, <laughs> I know because of that. I'm an introvert, extrovert all the way. So... Now, you know, I want to talk about lifelong learners. Many of us, especially leaders, describe ourselves as lifelong learners. What does that mean to you and what are you learning now? So lifelong learning to me is essential. That was another key finding that's in my book. So my book, I come up with what's called the authentic leadership development model. Mm -hmm. And in the second ring in that is actually a growth mindset or learning mindset. Mm -hmm. And so 
every leader that really wants to expand their ability to lead in different situations are always curious and learning. Mm-hmm. And so I think I exemplify that by the fact that I went and got a PhD and tried to do three startups. And every time I do a startup, it's in a different sector. So I've got to read about that sector. And I'm a genuinely curious person. I had a podcast for three years where I interviewed people about their personal journey. I think that curiosity is really a critical thing for a leader because it allows you to challenge your assumptions. It allows you to listen to other possibilities. And I think the best leaders are the ones that realize that things are nuanced. It's not black and white. Of course, they're black and white topics, but overall, there's always two perceptions in the room. There's always different interpretations and intent. Mm -hmm. And so to assume one person's intent means that you are negating and devaluing their actual intent without knowing it. So mm-hmm. for me, curiosity, it's in my blood. At times I wish I was more curious. If I'm gonna project failure in this category, it's because I do have four kids and a startup and wrote a book and I'm a little bit busy, mm-hmm. but curiosity is there and it's necessary. You know, my wife is way less curious than I am but she's curious about her topic, whatever her topic is. So she's a triathlon coach and she could tell you all sorts of stuff that I could care less about, but she's really into that. Like she Um, digs deep into that one thing. Yeah. I mean, she just Mm -hmm. read a book that was all about the science of some sort of something. She tried Mm -hmm. to tell me I didn't get it, um, but she was really into it. For her, she goes deep into one topic where I tend to be 50 feet across 50 topics. That's where your pivots come in. Yes, totally. So if there were something you could change in education, what would that be? I'm not an education that matters. Yeah, let me explain that. Mm -hmm. I think what I do is the easiest form of education. I think people who come on your show who are in elementary and high school and middle school, they are the heroes in the process because their jobs are thankless. Their jobs are grossly underpaid. And the lack of support they get from a community typically is very low. Not all communities are like that. There are some very hands-on, great communities. But overall, as a nation, we are failing miserably in education on so many levels. And I say that as someone who has such respect for educators because their job is not easy at all. And so if I was to say a magic wand, I think the first thing I do is I'd make it an actual profession that is seen by the whole country as a respected profession. I feel like that is a huge problem because people have this perception that teachers get three months off in the summer, so right. screw them. And you know what? They're also working 15-hour days, six okay. days a week to get through the year. Mm-hmm. So you know what? They deserve a little time off okay. at the end of the day, and they don't get paid for it. Mm-hmm. So I think it's Finland is a great model. They pick the top of the classes, they pay them like professionals, and you have the best and brightest teaching the future. Like I think one of the fundamental problems we have in, in the country is that so many communities don't realize that the inputs of grade one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven pay dividends in the community when they get out of high school. That's right. And they don't see it. And I, right. I don't understand why, but to me... If I had a second wish, it's getting people to understand that the inputs of the first six years of a child's education are the most important inputs for the lifelong Mm -hmm. learning and education of that child. And for me, I would say to also input and teach leadership skills, the social emotional skills that will create our future leaders and help them lead themselves well and become leaders who are ready for anything that comes at them. So I'm with you, James. All right. So what have you read, watched, or listened to that our listeners should as well? And why? I won't mention Game of Thrones. No spoilers. I haven't seen it yet. (laughs) Nobody died. That's all you need to know. There's a great book by Dr. Jackie Stavros and Dr. Sherry Torres, and it's called Conversations Worth Having. Mm -hmm. And it's really a practical application of appreciative inquiry and some really simple techniques. And so I think fundamentally, a really great book that everybody should read because it helps you understand the fact that the patterns that you create and the questions that you ask are directly related to the answers that you get. And they teach you how to flip the questions from a negative to an appreciative question. They get tons of examples, but it's easy. It's not researchy. So I really appreciate that. From a watch perspective, I just watched a documentary about all the kids on Prozac and Ritalin and Adderall. And so many kids, I didn't realize this, take that. Mm -hmm. 
just so they can focus and get better grades. And that just mm. blew my mind. Is it on Netflix? Yeah. It is on Netflix. Yeah, I think it's called The Pill. Perfect. All right, so you have a lot of responsibilities, James. What do you do on a daily basis to set that beautiful mind of yours? Not enough. At different points in my journey, I've been really intentional about being mindful at least once a day. Now, what I do is I listen to my body, and if it feels like it's crashing, I allow myself to lay down for a 15 minute nap, and that resets my mind. You know, one of the things I'm really curious about and want to do is transcendental meditation. For some reason, that just calls to me. I don't know why, because traditional mindfulness doesn't really work for me, but so I don't do enough. Let's put it that way. I should do more. Own it. I own that. <laughs> All right. So, James, if you were to go back in time, what advice would you give the younger you about leadership? Leadership is work. Persistence is key and presence is a must. Well said. Thank you. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? As a parent of four kids, I know a lot of your listeners are educators. I just want to say I thank you guys. Thank all of you that get in the classroom and do a job that for some reason is not respected by the greater masses. You have my respect wholeheartedly. Thank you. Well, James, I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. Uh, Lily, thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for your time, energy, and willingness to have me on your show. It's been fun. I've never spoken to anyone from Dubai. Most don't when I get on their podcast. Okay. Have a great evening. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hello, leaders. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.